Lisa. And what we will do now is we are going to work on this barn scene of the Daniels Barn in Blackstone, Massachusetts. And we're going to work on it as a pen and ink watercolor. So where this one that you're looking at right now is a crayon resist watercolor with white edges around everything, with a pen and ink drawing, things are black on all the edges. So it's a different kind of feel. And pen and ink drawings are often done as part of a sketching project where you sketch something with pen to give yourself the lines and then you paint in the colors so that you have the colors that you're working with. I am just looking around to see where my pen and ink pens have gone to. <laughs> Usually I keep them right in here's one. See if it's the one that works. And just the one that works. That's good. Okay, so we'll put that up for a moment. And let that dry. And let me cut myself a piece of watercolor paper. So if you want to paint along with this part, you'll want watercolor paper and a waterproof pen. And I suppose watercolors. <laughs> watercolors would be useful. And just cutting piece of paper. Ready. So welcome. I am Lisa Shea, and we were going to be doing a pen and ink watercolor of the Daniels Farm in Blackstone, Massachusetts. So this is a historic for historic farm. It was established in 1750. It's been in the same family since 1797. The house was built in 1830, hen house 1830, the barn 1850, the cider mill 1870, so quite old buildings and it's fun to come out here and visit. You can have food from their farm stand when they have that out. You can hear music from the Claflin Hill Orchestra when they're playing, so all sorts of fun things to do here. And it's right on the main road, so you can drive by and take a look anytime you want. It's a piece of our New England history here. So with pen and ink watercolors, this is a great technique to learn because this is a great way to go somewhere, even for just five or ten minutes, and sketch out a scene and get some sense of the colors in it. And that way you get practice with quick sketching, and also those quick sketches can be quite powerful art pieces in their own right. Many artists use those kinds of quick sketches as a starting point. So they make a couple of sketches somewhere, and then they go back to their studio, and then they do a longer-term painting or drawing or whatever their process is going to be. When you're doing sketching with watercolors, you want to use a water-resistant ink because you don't want to draw something and then when you're painting over it have all the ink smear and run and have a big, uh, big black mess on your paper. So I use uh, the Sakura Jelly Roll 06 pens. It just happens to be what a sketch artist who came and worked with us at the Blackstone Valley Art Association recommended a couple of years ago. It doesn't matter 
what you use. It just matters that it is not going to get all runny when you start painting over it with watercolors. So it's good not to start drawing with the pen. It's good to draw with pencil so that way if you want to change something you can change it with the pencil before you go over it with the pen. So I am going to get out my pencil eraser in case I have things that I want to change. And you could draw it freehand in pencil if you have gotten to the point where you are comfortable with doing that kind of drawing freehand. Or you can use tracing paper to transfer the image. So we have the whole video before that we did with the tracing paper. If you need help with how to make it. I have my pre-made farm image that I created. And I have my tracing paper ready here. So I am going to tape these together onto my watercolor paper so that they stay stationary while I do the tracing. I've got the tracing paper and graphite taped down to my watercolor paper so I can transfer the design. It's always good to make a little test mark before you start in the corner just to make sure that you have the graphite paper in the correct orientation because it does have a top side and a bottom side. One side does not have graphite on it and the other side does have graphite on it. And again, it's best to start from one side and work your way to the other because it's hard to know what you've traced and what you haven't traced without constantly looking underneath. And again, it's not that the pencil is magically going through the paper or through the graphite. All you are doing is applying pressure to the graphite and that pressure is pushing the graphite down off of the graphite paper and onto its destination surface. So you could be doing this with a thumbnail or a stylus or something else. It's just generally more comfortable for people to hold a pencil because they have practiced using a pencil for many years of their life. I'm going to do this fairly dark so you can see it in the video, but it could be that for your own project you want to end up doing this fairly light. And again, if your aim is to practice your sketching skills, then maybe you wouldn't use a pencil drawing at all to start with. Maybe you would just sketch straight with pen. But I'm showing you different techniques so that you can get some ideas of how you want to do things. And part of the fun of art is trying different things. Try one thing, see if it works for you. Try another thing, see if it works. And I've heard some people talk about their art and say, oh, that one was awful. It's important not to think about your works as awful. They're all stepping stones. You know, we all start somewhere, we all practice, and we all change over time. And where you are now is different than where you'll be in five years, and it's different from where you used to be. And that is a good thing. It's good that we're all learning and changing. But rather than thinking of those old things as awful, just think of them as stages in your learning process. And you were as good as you could be for where you were then, and now you are as good as where you could be. And you should be proud of where you are, and proud of the growth you will make in the future if you keep practicing. I'm sure all of us look at things and say, oh, I could have done that better, and I could have done this other thing better. And that's fine to think of ways to keep improving. And at the same time, it's good to look at where you are and say, you know, I'm pleased with how I did that, and I'm getting better at this other thing. You know, count your progress. 
as well as looking for areas in where you could improve. And this tree over here. Alright, let me check. Make sure you got all the key sections before you take everything apart. Oops, I didn't get this line. I believe I got everything. Can't tell if I got that one door. Yeah, I got that door. Alright. So when you're sure that you have transferred everything, that's important. If you were doing the transfer paper method. Okay, cut it back apart. Hello, kittens. You guys having fun running around the house? Little kitten Tasmanian devils. Brip indeed. Brip. Alright, so again, graphite paper can be used and reused and reused lots and lots of times. Transfer paper. I can keep tracing this and tracing this. So I've done two pictures with this so far and I could keep making more. So that also gets saved for future use. Alright, so now we have a piece of watercolor paper with a rough pencil design on it. And again, if your aim is just to do a quick pen, a quick pen sketch, you don't even need the pencil stage. You can just sketch quickly with pen. But in this particular case, this helps get the basic shapes down and shows you a different technique. Alright, so we've got our waterproof pen. It's important when working with watercolors <laughs> and pen that your pen is waterproof. So now I'm going to go over these pencil lines with the pen because with pen and ink part of the beauty of it is the dark pen against the lighter watercolor images. So again my aim is not to be super precise in these sketches because I want it to have sort of a loose sketchy feel to it. This isn't about ruler straight. This isn't about precise angles. It's about getting the general feel of the building. If anything, I like it to be a little off because it gives that sense that you were hanging out there just making a quick sketch because you happened to stop by and you see that it was just so lovely you wanted to capture its essence. I'm also drawing at a strange angle because of the tripod, so I have to release any desire for perfection anyway. Alright, we have those. Roof line. So let me know if you have any questions in the comments. I'm happy to answer questions. Happy just to chat. When you are working with pen and ink, keep in mind that the ink is coming out of the pen wet. I know we tend to think of pen as drying super fast, and it does dry super fast compared with the old days of quill ink. 
where they had to sprinkle things onto the ink to get it to dry. But it's still, when you are drawing with it, try not to drag your hand across the areas that you just put down <laughs> because that ink is still wet and it can still smear before it gets the chance to dry. Okay, now just a little rough wiggly tree areas. Doesn't have to be any particular way. Just has to be generally tree-y. Now when I did the previous Korean Resist version, I, uh, I added chickens to it. I could add chickens again. I like to mix things up a little, but the chickens were pretty cool. And I could add goats. I could add two kids playing. I'm just sort of a chicken person. <laughs> I'm fond of chickens. I admit my chicken fondness. They are just so cool. So I'm going to add a couple of chickens down here. what these chickens are going to be doing. Alright. Yeah, I'll just have the three chickens this time. I won't have the little baby chicks. Alright, so we got three chickens. We got the barn. Got this guy. So I think that we are done with the ink part. So again, waterproof ink. That's the thing that matters. This happens to be a Sakura 6 jelly roll. But the key important part is to use watercolor with waterproof ink. So it does not smear. So next up, I do any non-focal areas. So do the backgrounds like the sky, the foregrounds like the dirt area, and I do them wet on wet. I just realized I don't have any horizon over here. Alright, so let's start with the sky. So for wet on wet, start with a clean brush. Get the whole area you want to work on wet. So I'm just putting water in the areas where the blue sky is going to be. Now with crayon resist we had an actual border of wax along these lines that would help repel the paint and make a line and keep the color areas separate. The ink will not do that at all. The ink does not provide any boundary at all to the watercolor paint. So we have to be more cautious ourselves to be able to put this water only where we want the blue sky to be. Every time I say blue sky I think of a Pink Floyd song. <laughs> we all have our own 
songs that get stuck in our heads. I've also had the songs from Hamilton stuck in my head for a long, long time. But I do not have any Blue Sky song from Hamilton stuck in my head, so I suppose that's a good thing. If you get brush hairs on your painting, that's okay. It'll be very easy just to wipe away later, so do not worry about that. Alright, my house is very dry, so the wet water is already drying very quickly, so I have to work on the sky fairly quickly. And this little hole in here. Alright, let's work with this blue this time. Mix things up a little. So because this area is wet with water, you can see the color is just billowing out all on its own. I don't have to paint in every last detail. And whatever I paint in is going to grow and merge over time anyway. So you're just tossing in color and letting it fillow out. It'll get into all those nooks and crannies all by itself as it flows with the water. And it also gives it a nice dappled kind of effect which the actual sky has. Kittens. Kittens, there's two of you. Hey, hey, hey. All right, got the kittens distracted a little from eating each other's heads. They're siblings and normally they get along, but as we know, <laughs> human siblings, sweeties, Sweeties, don't make me come over there. Leave her alone. Alright, I'm back. <laughs> A little bit of kitten excitement going on. We mostly get along, but sometimes they just decide that it's time to eat each other's heads clean off. Alright, so now just spread things a little so that we don't end up with any areas that are too dark or too bright. And things are already starting to dry. That's just how quickly you get distracted by cats trying to chop each other's brains out. Yep, we're just trying to get a rough idea of this guy in here. It sort of gives you that sense of there being maybe some cloud layers and so on out there. Alright, so I'm happy with that being the general sky scene. And again, the, the general idea for a pen and ink sketch is that this is a rough, loose view of what the scene is like. So it doesn't have to be super precise. And if anything, the looseness of it gives it more of a sense of it being something that you did dash off because you pulled over to the side of the road, you just thought it was a pretty scene, and you quickly made a sketch to show what the scene was like. Alright, so we've got the blue of the sky. Next up we're going to tackle the brown of the 
foreground area. So again, I'm just using clean water to paint water in to this area that I'm going to be turning brown. I'm going to paint around the chickens because in watercolor everything works in layers and you can see through each layer to the layer underneath. So if we painted brown and then tried to paint a light yellow on top of it, we would see through the yellow to the brown and the chickens would be yellow-brown, which isn't necessarily what we are aiming for here. I'm going to go with dark colored chickens, I think, so they stand out. Well, I suppose we could leave them light, or we can leave the chickens until the end and see what strikes our fancy. Now I'd say that, <laughs> but I like chickens, so we'll see if I can resist painting those chickens in until the very end of everything. I suppose it's like putting off dessert until the very end. Maybe it makes it that much more lovely to enjoy it at the end of the process. Alright, let's use this brown. It's good to try to mix up colors and try different colors at different times and see what works for you. And if you try something and say, well, that didn't quite work out the way I wanted it to, now you've learned something. Everything you try in life is an experiment to see what the results are, how well that worked. Sometimes you're pleased and sometimes you have happy accidents and you do something that you didn't think was going to work and it actually worked out pretty well. And the only way you know is to try. So try and experiment. See what works. Be generally optimistic about what could happen. Yeah, chickens. We've got a dirt courtyard for our little barn area. And again, it's good that it's not all the exact same darkness of brown because that gives a sense of light and shadow playing on things and the different textures of the courtyard area and so on. Alright, so now we've got a sky and we've got a courtyard. Now it's important to remember that watercolors do flow if there's water involved, that the paint is suspended in water and if you put down I don't know, a splotch of green there, the green would spread out in that wet area. So take a little time for things to dry in between sections that touch. So for example, this barn area, this area here is still a little wet and the area below it is still a little wet. So it'd be a little dangerous for me to try to paint the red barn and not have the red of that barn accidentally touch one of these other wet areas and have the red spread out into it. So sometimes you work on multiple paintings at the same time so that you can work on something else while the section you're working on is drying. But what I'm going to do here is carefully <laughs> work on this tree and try to make sure I don't get too close to the blue of the sky 
so I don't have the green of the tree billowing out into the blue of the sky. And I'm going to do this soft and fuzzy because I think this time, last time I did an autumn tree, this time I think I'm going to do summertime trees. So I'm going to drop in some green, summertimey leaves. Well, I want to give the sense of leaves and dappled light. Right, so far it's not going out into the blue, which is good. Want a couple of different shades of green in there. And if anything, I want darker green down at the bottom because that's where the shadows are. And lighter green up in the top. So that's where the sun's hitting it. Alright. Green. Alright, that's still looking <laughs> sort of wet over there, so I'm a little nervous about touching that area of the tree just now while things are still drying. Well, well I suppose let's risk the red of the barn. I'm trying to do things reasonably quick here so that you see how this all works. Well, let's see what that red. Let's try <laughs> bright red. to leave a little bit of white trim around the edges. And I suppose actually the white trim, I'm just nervous about getting too close to that brown. It's still wet. <laughs> still has the potential to suck the color up. Normally I would turn this around or paint these different directions, but I'm trying to paint everything in one direction so you can see what I am doing. to paint the barn areas red and also leave white trim around the windows and doors. This is a good challenge for me to be able to do this at these angles around the tripod holder without turning the paper. We all create different challenges for ourselves, which is good. It's good for our brains. And remember that watercolor paintings are painted in layers, so this is just a first layer of color to establish a baseline. And then you would come back in with a second layer of red to maybe add in some details, and a third layer of red to add in some shadings. So this is a place to get one started. Or alternatively, if you just wanted to do this quick and easy, give a sense of the barn, then that's fine too.
you could just imagine that you stopped for a few moments to take a look at this barn. You got a sense of it. And then you had to keep driving somewhere else. Alright, so... Here in the shadows. And the more that you paint, the more that you get a sense of what you enjoy, what you like about paintings, what kind of scenes make you happy. needs to go right up against the ground. Hopefully the ground is dry now. So it does not cause a pillow of red. <laughs> You often can see the brush stroke directionality in a watercolor painting, so if something is made up of vertical slats, it's good to paint it in vertical slats, and vice versa. Alright, barn doors. Maybe it's because I grew up in New England, but barn scenes are very relaxing and comforting to me. But I imagine if I grew up on a commercial farm and I was forced to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning every morning and go out and do hard labor all day long, I might have a different view. A friend of mine grew up on a horse farm. And many of us might think that that was an idyllic kind of life, <laughs> but to him it was a life of quite a lot of work. And he was not so keen on all of the horse farm chores and duties. So it's all a matter of your perspective on things. So this sidewall is actually much darker. So on one hand I could mix in purple or blue or something else to get it to give sort of a darker aspect to it. But also just adding in more pigment blocks the light from getting to the paper. And that naturally makes it darker because so much of what a watercolor's glow comes from comes from the light of the room getting through the paint to the paper and then bouncing back out at you, giving it that sort of stained glass glow effect.
star, same color. And this area up here in the cupola is red. Give that a minute to dry. Rinse off my brush. Tree. Bark. It's looking a little too close to the ground color. Maybe we can darken this up a bit so it stands out as being a little different. Alright, let's do the top half of this tree on the left. We'll use a light summery color. So we got the brush is wet and the paper is dry in this case so it stays pretty much where we put it. I'm putting down a base layer of light green as a starting point. Drop in a few little dabs of a darker green. Maybe some of the leaves. I'm going to put more of them down in the lower areas to be the more shadowy area. And see how the Things that I add into the wet paint spread and grow. So it helps remain retain its soft focus. And so it doesn't hopefully catch the eye. Because the aim is not for this to be about this tree. The aim is for it to be about the barn and that the tree is just a little side area. Alright, so far so good. So we've got the barn roof needs to be gray. Hopefully the barn is now dry enough that I can carefully put in a little bit of the gray. And not have it cause any problems. Yep, you want to make sure adjacent areas are dry so the color does not accidentally get sucked along into an area that color does not belong in. Alright, 
grey and the little purple on there. Okay, that seems to have gone in without a trouble. Got a darker grey. And these windows. Getting these brush hairs coming off my brushes. What color should the chickens be? One of them should be black. And the other one should be brownish, I think. Sort of blend in with the background, but that's okay. got the remaining pine tree which is a darker green. I have to be careful because all this stuff around it is so wettish. All right, so we'll go with this green. The cats are still eating each other's heads. But we'll see if I have to go interfere in this cat excitement in a moment. Alright, so first I'm putting down a base layer of this darker green. to get a starting point. Want to be careful around the wet red, around the wet gray, so that I don't have the colors run together. So far, so good. Alright, so again the aim here is to show that this is a pine tree without having the eye drawn to this pine tree over here. So we got the base layer down. Now we start to add in some sort of pine tree swooping details. We don't want this to be a study of pine trees. We just want to give the general sense of it. And again, we want it to be a little darker down at the bottom areas. Because that's the way 
nature tends to work is to have shadows in lower areas. Actually, I'm grabbing the right green. Once the set is all wet, you can sort of see that it's swirling and feeding and getting lighter as it dries, and that is all okay. If you were doing a precise watercolor painting, you could come back and add layer after layer, but we are doing a sketch here. Give a general sense how this scene is laid out. A sense of the directionality of the branches. And in general, when you're looking at a scene, things that are darker and richer in color tend to be closer to you, and things tend to get seem lighter and gentler as they get off into the distance, sort of like when you look at mountains, they get purpler and softer when you look at them in the distance. So you want to think about that in here, have the lighter colors in general in the back, and for the thing that is your main focal interest area, you want the brightest colors and the lightest lights and the darkest darks to be there because that is where the eye is drawn. Now I keep drawing these horizontal lines because my printer has the horizontal lines running vertically, but I wonder <laughs> if the barn is actually made up of... or vertical, <laughs> sorry drawing these vertical lines, but I wonder if the barn is actually made up of horizontal lines like a house would be. I'm trying to think which way it would be more natural. Can't really see in this picture which way it is. So you want the thing that the person's eye should be drawn to, to have the most contrast in the painting in general, so that when someone steps up to a painting, their eye is drawn to the thing that you want them to look at. In this case, that would be the barn, and you want to have some things that are dark and some things that are light, so that there's some visual interest in there. And the main focal area shouldn't be like the trees <laughs> or the chickens, even though the chickens are cute. It should be the barn itself. painting the same red, but subsequent layers make it get darker and darker looking. As it blocks more and more of the light. Oh, 
Alrighty. And one could sit here and make changes, but the point is to show you a quick, easy ink sketch with watercolor image and to get a sense of how it works. So the aim is not to paint for hour after hour, although you certainly could add in additional layers and to even out the colors and all that other kind of good fun stuff. I think you get a sense of how this works. Right, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Alright, so to summarize for pen and ink watercolor, if you want a guiding image to start with, you can use tracing paper and graphite paper to get a graphite or pencil sketch down to have a starting point, and then you could follow over that with waterproof pen so that when you do all the painting stuff, the pen does not get smushed or uh, messed up. I'm using Jelly Roll 06 from Sakura. You can use whatever you want to as the waterproof pen. If you don't want to do the pencil sketch starting point, you can just sketch in pen, and that is fine. That's how many artists uh, get their scenes laid down. Once you've got the pen and ink sketched down, then you fill in colors to give you a sense of the colors involved with watercolors. And I used wet on wet for the sky and for the ground so that it has that soft billowy effect where I painted with wet paint into wet paper. And then for these areas here, I did wet on dry, which is where the paper is dry and the watercolor is wet and that gives you better control over the precise areas that you're working in. So let me know if you have any questions at all about any aspects of doing a pen and ink watercolor.